with infinite complacency, people went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, thinning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. The supernatural and paranormal are everywhere, and podcasts like Into the Fray keep tabs on all of it. If it's really happening and not just stories, there might be a group out there standing between the monsters and us. Welcome to Project Threshold. Now there's one state where the high strangeness cranks up to a whole new level, Alaska. So many things happen in Alaska, it requires an entire team to keep the horrors in check. Hannah Riker has a personal score to settle, hunting the monster that slaughtered her parents. Neville, Toddy, and Melissa McCoy have her back as they look for missing people, encounter the legendary Kushtaka, and discover an ancient race who dispense their own justice. Created by Craig Crawford, check out the third novella in the Project Threshold series as they continue the fight against things that hunt us in the dark. Available in November at Amazon, Apple Books, and Barnes and Noble. Search Project Threshold Team Riker. So on this edition of Into the Fray, I welcome Justin on with me, and he is one of the hosts of the Cryptids of the Corn podcast. And if you can't guess by the title, that is a podcast out of Ohio. Justin, welcome on the show. Hey, thank you for having me. Like I said off air, it was, it's been great that you even be invited on here. You know, we've been listening to you forever and we graciously appreciate it. Absolutely. No, I, I appreciate it. And uh, to have a fellow podcaster on, especially out of the area that you are and the subject matter we are going to be covering today, it is a double win for me. Okay, so before we get to our, and uh, this is shouldn't be a huge shocker to folks, uh, considering the title of your show, we're going to have some Bigfoot talk today in relation to you. This is not just you coming on and sharing other people's stories. This is your own, so it's going to be awesome. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit about your show. Tell folks about it. Oh, okay. So Crib is the Corn Podcast, we like to say where we're scientific and magical thinking combined. I was a biologist. I did eDNA, environmental surveys, and endangered species surveys. So, you know, talking about Bigfoot, what are always the fun things, you know, eDNA and endangered species. My big credit is I can't fully talk about the survey yet because it's still, you know, NDAs and whatnot. But we found extirpated species, which is locally extinct in areas where the government said they weren't there. And we found them and proved they existed. So we've done that kind of work before. Uh, and Jay, my co-host, uh, who you've had the pleasure of meeting, he's a wild man. He's much more the conspiracy side of the show. So you get a, you definitely get that good mix. Find us on any podcast platform, Facebook, uh, Instagram. If you have an encounter you want to reach out or just anything you want to reach out, it's cryptids of the corn podcast at gmail.com. Uh, and, you know, we do Patreon and all that stuff. I think that's, Jay's normally a lot better at promoting than I am. I'm, I'm definitely not as good at it. I am also terrible at promotions. If I could, I would not have any social media outlet, but we have to. So, yes. yes. <laughs> With yeah. what we do, we have to. I'm a terrible self-promoter. Uh, so, yeah, the yin and the yang there is probably a perfect mix then for you guys when you hop on to record, right? Yeah, we are. It, it's, it's been a wild ride. We've been the number one nature podcast four times in the U.S. this year. Uh, we've taken that spot four times. I got the little screenshots because we're good friends with Tony Merkel and we like to pick on him. Well, that's awesome. And you have the the biologist tag to kind of, I mean, that's that's good. A lot of us, 
we sit here and we we talk about animals or perspective animals that could be out there, but you have a, a scientific look at everything, which is good. Oh yeah, it's definitely it's been interesting because there's a lot with Bigfoot that, which I'm sure we'll talk about. There's a lot with Bigfoot that does match biological datas and biological sciences that it seems like the rough end of the biological community, the people that may not fully understand it just kind of ignore. But Bigfoot makes a lot of biological sense, which after, you know, we talk, you know, we can get into that because there's some interesting stuff there. Oh, we absolutely will. Yeah, and I think that'll be some good closing info because as you well know, anytime you talk about Bigfoot, usually the question back and forth is, what do you think Bigfoot is? How could we have not found it yet? Blah, blah, blah. All that good stuff. So, yes, we will absolutely get into that. But before we do, and people will appreciate uh, me not yammering on for 25 minutes, and they're like, can I hear the Bigfoot encounters, please? Shush up, Shannon. We're going to dive right in and go to the summer of 2011. And I'm sure that you will, but I... I know exactly the type of area you mentioned in the email, but for people that don't know, just describe how how oh, different parts of Ohio, how very different it can be, you know, considering there's there are swaths of very thick, brushy, thorny woods, and then you drive to certain other areas, and there's just little patches of woods with farmland. So let's set the scene, and uh, we'll dive in. So yeah, Ohio is actually made up of four biospheres, which is pretty weird for a state. That means there's four pretty unique types of environment. I'm in Northwest Ohio, specifically Hardin County. We are the corn part of the state, you know, where everybody makes the jokes that Ohio is nothing but corn and soybeans. That's where I live. But then you can go, you know, two and a half hours away and you're in the foothills of Appalachia or you go another different two and a half hours away. You're in the Great Lakes, you know, forest and, you know, the cold forest uh, or you can go to the river bottoms. You know, so Ohio is very diverse in just habitat alone. Which is amazing for us, uh, so, you know, specifically me and my wife go salamander, like we go salamander hunting, we take pictures of salamanders and all kinds of stuff. So for us, it's a really easy to do that in our own state because you can just travel two hours and you're a whole different biosphere with whole different plants and animals. So my part of Ohio is not very exciting as far as wildlife or anything like that. Uh, we got a lot of corn and then there's some more corn. And then after that, you will see corn and then soybeans. <laughs> But no, it's just, it's a really interesting part. You know, it's not what you think of Bigfoot, you know, or any kind of large wildlife. You know, we have deer in Turkey, uh, but right now we're harvesting. And then once the fields come off, it's really barren. You know, we don't have a lot of trees. So we're, my property that we'll talk about tonight was the, had the, uh, had a part of the largest woods in Hardin County. I won't give out the address because we don't live there anymore. And I don't want these poor people being harassed anymore than they probably already are. But from that information, you will probably figure out at least what woods it is. Because when you look on Google Earth, it's not that hard to figure it out. But yeah, like we have woods. We don't have forests. You know, we have corn and woods. Not very many large cities. Lima, Ohio is the biggest one near us. And I think it has like 45,000 people. We're, you know, much smaller community. What part of Ohio did you live in when you lived here? I was up uh, where we get the wonderful lake effect snow up in Westlake. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we sit, we right in the Blanchard Valley. So we, we, uh, where we're sitting still get the lake effect and then 30 miles away, they don't have anything. So we're very, very lucky, I guess. How, how f much further West would I have had to go from Westlake? Just roughly. You'd had to go South probably about 45 minutes and then probably over 35 or 45 minutes. Gotcha. So right, you know, right in the almost the dead center of the northwest corner. Uh, when you take Ohio, where District Two is what it's called. Uh, when, when you look at the map of Ohio, District Two, we're right in the middle. Hardin County is a very small rural county, even in this part of Ohio, because we're pretty far away from all. You know, we're pretty far away from Dayton, and we're pretty far away, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, when you drive through it, you can drive all the way to Chicago, and you really don't know you left Ohio. You know, until you get to Chicago. That is true. So at that point, when you mentioned that, I've probably been close to that area, but I don't know that I've driven straight through there. I would have to kind of take a peek at a map, which I will do, because now I'm I'm wondering if I have. Yeah, it's right. We're right by the junction of 31 and 75, the two major highways. 
so most people have driven right past Ada. Well, I'm in Ada, but most people driven right past Ada and had no idea they did it. Do you want me to cut that out? No, it's fine. Okay. They can know. I, I don't in, care. In fact, uh, I was, it's funny you mentioned those two, the highways, uh, freeways is something I was texting with Jake about with you coming on was we were talking about Ohio and I said, I don't know how people got around Ohio uh, without having a navigator back in the day if they had to use a paper map because like here in Las Vegas, we've got the 215, we've got the 95, and we've got the 15. It's very easy. Uh, but in Ohio, if you're driving an hour or two hours or even more away, you've got about 85 different like freeway oh, changes God. on and off. And I'm going, I thank God that I live in this day and age and I just moved to Ohio that I have GPS on my phone. It's crazy. Uh, and then we have so many that are like, so there's 30, 31, 33, and 32 are all major ones. And it's, it's, it's very confusing because they all run into each other. Yep. It's, it's, it's a state that doesn't look like you can get lost in, but you definitely oh. can. Yeah. Even with, and the, you know, the GPS, especially Apple is like, it'll tell you six years before a turn, but then like right before, like right yeah. before it's like, Oh no, it's right here. You're like, damn it. I'm three lanes over. I, you know, I don't have time. Not happening. Yeah. You're like, thanks a lot. Apple maps. I appreciate you. All right. So I, sorry, I'm digressing yet again. No, it, it's Ohio. It's Ohio. Pretty good. So, uh, my property specifically was on the largest woods. Our driveway was about a half mile long. Uh, so, Basically, the woods is way set off back. My parents wanted to build a house right against the woods, and we had our own little farm. We had about 15 acres of pasture and probably about 15 or 20 acres of the owned of this woods and creek. Our, so our driveway is super long, though. Like, we could see our nearest neighbor, but not very well. Like, we were little kids. You know, we were young boys, and so we'd pee outside and not have to worry about nothing, even though we had, quote-unquote, neighbors. The first – do you want me to just go ahead and get into it? Yes, please. So – the first year, 2011, we just kind of had all kinds of strange stuff start to happen. And 2011, uh, about May is when everything started. It started really small. Uh, we had this giant, we had all kinds of animals. We had probably 10 horses. My mom at one point had probably 100 goats, and I had probably about four or 500 birds, chickens, ducks, and that kind of stuff. Uh, so my dad would just buy feed by the pallet, you know, so we'd get a whole pallet load of food. So he built this giant basically feed bin they had one lid on it so there'd be three types of feed you know horse goat and chicken and it each fit a pallet so it's quite large so it took either one of the big kids could lift the lid by themselves or uh two of the small kids i have three biological siblings and two adopted siblings so we all had our own 4-h ffa projects we all had our own chores and stuff like that so this first year there's random stuff is getting like piled up around the yard and uh, specifically in the fence line and it could be like buckets and little pieces of wood, hay bales, like just, just random stuff. And we were kind of blaming each other because life was already hard. So why are one of our siblings making it harder, you know? And then this this big feed bin lid would get left open. And specifically horse grain would be what was going missing. Uh, and I, I don't know if you know what any have ever been around horse grain or horse feed, but for your listeners... Horse feed is basically covered in molasses. So it's it's really sweet, even to us. You know, if you get a little bit in your mouth or whatever, it's it's pretty sugary. Uh, so later on, you know, we figured out that's probably why that one was the one going missing because it probably tastes the best. So, yeah, we get these little stacks kind of everywhere, and they're happening pretty often. And then we were getting this feed missing, and this happens throughout the summer. So at this time, I was working at McDonald's. Uh, it was 4th of July weekend. And we had, oh, I already skipped stuff. That, that's why I write notes. So before I tell you that part, our house was shaped like a U. So the two tips of the U were glass rooms. One was the kitchen. One was the living room. So they were you know, kind of parallel to each other, but you'd have to go all the way through the house, the bottom of the U, to get to the one room to the other. Uh, and they faced into the woods. Also, we had giant stadium lights in a part of the pasture the horses overheat very easily. So my dad and we got installed like these big football stadium lights so we could work these horses at night so they wouldn't overheat. And there was also four-wheeler trails cut into the woods. So they just looked like blank holes, like cookie-cuttered into the woods. 
That's why I make notes. I always forget. Jay's really good about reminding me about all this stuff. My brain's a big scramble. Oh, I'm in the same club. Don't even worry about it. So 4th of July weekend, we had a camper at Indian Lake, which is about 35 minutes away. It is that Friday of 4th of July weekend. And I get off. I'm closer at McDonald's here in town. So it's probably like 11, 11.30. So I am already like tired. I call my mom and I say, hey, I'm not coming up to the lake tonight. I already missed the fireworks. So I'm just going to go home and sleep. And then I'll come up in the morning. I get home and I'm the only one there. Huge house. She's probably the only one there. I open the door to let the dogs out and they won't come into the kitchen. So this glass room, the one tip of the U, they won't, they're standing in the hallway. So the dogs are Sonny. He is a Labradoodle. He was actually my brother's service animal. My brother has muscular dystrophy. So this is a highly trained dog. He won't come into the kitchen, go to the bathroom. Then there was Bailey and Clarice. So Bailey was a 40 pound, like, a beagle mutt, and then Clarice was a Yorkie poo. So they hadn't been into the bathroom in hours, and none, nobody would come outside. I don't, they won't even come to the kitchen. And at this point, I don't really think that's weird. I'm like, okay, whatever. I'm so tired. So I close the door, and as I start walking through the bottom of the house, so the U, the dogs are following me pretty tight, which isn't odd. I just got off McDonald's. I smell like a French fry. I'm sure I'm the best smelling thing for them right now. I go to the living room, and I lay down on the couch. And this is the other all glass room and Bailey and Clarice jump up on me, which is an odd. What was really odd is Sonny tries to get on me. And this isn't, this is a service dog. This is a trained animal. You know, he knows not to push up on people and stuff like that. So I kind of bat him down and whatever. And then he lays right beside me. So that was really odd in itself that he's, his behavior is he's for, like forgotten all of his training. So it's just, you know, I start watching TV way off in the woods, uh, on the other side of this woods, I hear boom, boom, boom. It's 4th of July weekend. I don't think anything of it. There's like three or four families that are also own pieces of this woods that have houses back there. And most of them are older couples, but you know, I'm thinking it's somebody's grandkids are out, you know, it's 4th of July lighting fireworks off. And then about 10, 15 minutes later, a little closer, boom, boom, boom. Then 10, 15 minutes later, boom. Boom, boom. It's getting closer. It's working its way towards our house. So I called Nick. He was my best friend. He lived down the road, but he'd be in our woods. And I called Nick. I'm like, hey, are you out in the woods screwing off or whatever? He's like, no, we're actually in Pennsylvania tonight. We won't be back till tomorrow. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, somebody's kids are out there screwed around. So I just was seeing if it was you or not. So I hang up, you know, not scared or whatever at this point. Then there's this big dead tree in the corner of the yard. I just hear, Boom, boom, boom. I'm frozen. I'm, uh, what's freaking me out super bad is the dogs aren't making a noise. They're laying perfectly still. So this is probably like 300 yards away from where we're sitting, right? Like where I'm sitting at that point. And they're freaking me out really bad. And I'm just, I'm just, remember, I'm, I, there's guns in the next room. But I don't want to stand up because I'm in an all-glass room. And I don't want whoever's out there to see me. Then about another five, 10 minutes pass. And then on the side of our big metal barn, you just hear boom, boom, boom. It freaks the horses out so bad. They actually break out of the barn and you hear them going nuts in the pasture running big circles, went in and going crazy. And I'm frozen. I'm at this point, I'm almost in tears. And so they're about 150 yards away from the door. And then about five minutes later, there's a Porsche about 30 feet from where I'm sitting. And you just hear that Porsche. Boom, boom, boom. I'm bawling at this point. And what's freaking me out so, so bad is the dogs are not making a sound. They're not whimpering. Sonny has defended my mom. Sonny's a service. Like, Sonny's not doing anything, and it's freaking me out. I'm so scared. Whatever or whoever's out there is only 30 feet from me, right where I'm sitting right now. And at that very moment, my aunt and uncle came blaring down the driveway in their convertible. Whatever it was took off, you know, it was gone. I came out bawling. They came and, you know, they got me and the dogs and they took me into my grandma's house, uh, which was in town. The next morning, Nick's dad and my dad and me come out. So Nick's father uh, is retired military, retired military police and retired SWAT. He has a very accomplished career in law enforcement. So he comes out and he finds all the marks, all the sounds I heard, except when we get to the barn, he's like, yeah, Bill, which is my father. He's like, whoever was out here, hit the barn with a sledgehammer four times. 
And I'm arguing with him like, no, no, it was three times. I remember it was three times. He's like, no, he hit it four times. And why do you think it was a sledgehammer? He's like, well, it's a sledgehammer because it's about eight, eight and a half foot off the ground. So the only way a guy could hit up that high was with, a, you know, a long shanked hammer. And he's like, why I hit four times is because there's four indentations in a row up there. And then we found the same thing on the Porsche. So we found the four indentations again. You know, hindsight is 2020. Later on, you know, instead of it was probably hit something three times, but it had four knuckles. So it left four indentations instead of, but it was hitting the same spot three times. So the rest of that year, the same small stuff happened. It just, you know, it kept happening where grain was missing. And we were kind of really on edge. We were pretty sure it was a guy coming on the property and screwing with us at this point, which we are in a college town. Uh, so it's not, you know, uncommon to have college kids come out in the fields and destroy stuff and mess around. But around October, it all just stops. So that's the first year. Do you have any questions about that? Yeah, I do actually. Thank you. Uh, when this, when these strange stacks of things would mm -hmm. occur, you guys would probably take them down, put things back where yep. they need to go. Would they, would they reappear shortly thereafter? It was normally never exactly always the same stuff, but we, we were getting them almost weekly. So like it would be just random stuff from around the yard, you know, buckets and like tools and that kind of stuff. And but yeah, they they would they wouldn't appear like back again normally like the next night, but we'd have a different stack somewhere else the next week. Is your thinking then that considering all of this freaking racket is going on, it was pissing this Bigfoot off essentially? I I think well with the next year you may have more insights. I think it was a territorial thing. And I think he was letting us know that he owned some of our property. And that was kind of what was happening. When we get into the next year, it, it gets a lot more dramatic. So maybe he thought, okay, everybody's gone. Now they had left that day for the lake property. Yeah. They hadn't been probably, gone that long, right? Probably four or five o'clock. So it's okay. it probably been six or seven hours. Okay, so it's not like they had been gone for two days and then you show up out of the blue and right. he's like, why aren't you gone? Right, yeah. So, and then here's the weird thing is the dogs, the way they were reacting, I think he had already been at the house that night and was peek. I don't know if he's peeking in windows or whatever, uh, but Sonny was a trained service animal. Sonny jumped on me and he never did that before and he never did that since. So that was, to me, probably still for that first year, the 2011 stuff, the weirdest highlight is that he completely broke training completely like and he never did it wasn't one of those he had a very important job like my brother has muscular dystrophy so luke would lean on him so sonny knew he had to stand still you know perfectly and support weight it was just i don't know if he was messing with the dogs like earlier that day or if it was just that they could sense something that i couldn't you know that everybody talks about infrasound and all that stuff so I don't know if there was some of that going on and they knew something bad was up, but it was that to me was the highlight of making it real. It's just, it is there's the dogs, you know, and we always say on our show, trust dogs, you know, dogs, no trust dogs. Yeah. Big, beautiful glass rooms are wonderful until they're not <laughs> like in a situation as, such as that. Exactly. And it's just, when you were alone in facing into the Blackwoods, like there was a couple of those stadium lights up, but we had a lot of property that just went into a void. So we we're back on the bottom of a hill back, you know, in our property face into the woods. So you just looked into black forest and then here in that, you know, that now there's something out there. It's very odd. Those stadium oh. lights, could those be turned on from inside the house or was that a switch like out in the barn, something like that? They were fully on all night. They were mm. on a, like, they were automatic. So they're always on. My dad actually got them from the eight of football stadium when they were modeled. They were sold a bunch of their old ones. So they were full stadium lights on our power pole. So they, they were, we had to run power down the driveway and they were hooked up to those, which may have been not the most legal thing. I don't know. Oh, either way, it's really cool to have stadium lights out there. But yeah. if you were in, so where you were in that living room, 
where this thing was essentially beating the crap out of that side of that building, could you see that building from where you were? Was it bathed in light? It was not bathed in light. There was a couple small lights because uh, how the property worked is the driveway came in kind of facing the U. So this all was happening on the right side of the house where the barn and all that stuff was. Uh, if I were to stand up, I could have seen it. I just never stood up. I didn't want to stand up. I really just didn't want to see whoever who, yeah. whoever was out there. I didn't want them to see me. But you could have. Uh, there's little lights down there, but nothing like that. You know, we had the two giant stadium lights. No, I don't blame you for standing up. You're probably thinking, I'm going to stop, drop, and roll here in a second. Like, I don't know what to do. And I was just like, I weighed like 98 pounds. I was a scared little kid. Was that a big deal, though, for you to, to for or for your family, I should say, to know that you had that type of a reaction? You know, and you're at home. You're supposed to feel safe. And here you are. You're scared enough to where you're crying. Were they like, it, oh, man, like, this is some serious stuff. It bothered dad deeply with the next year of stuff. And my dad kind of hit a boiling point and dad was, we were convinced it was a ban and that's what bothered us more. And dad had people like we had people looking out for other people, like neighbors watching the woods and dad would try to put up cameras and stuff like that. And the stuff never stopped. So it, it deeply bothered my father that he was, there was somebody coming on the property bothering his kids that he couldn't catch. Right. Well, yeah, please, please continue. So the next year, uh, 2012 this year the this right around may again the stuff stacks start up immediately but they're huge they involve car hoods and hay bales and saw horses and big tools like they're getting to be a problem to take apart like uh because we had a couple project cars and they would be like engine parts and car hoods and doors and these big stacks all along the fence line uh the pasture fence and like a saw horse, I remember that was the bone that always stuck out. You know, we had these big metal saw horses and they probably weigh a hundred pounds. And the one was like sitting on top of this stack. So it's either a guy was out there throwing this stuff or, you know, it just, it was insane. And then the feed would go missing again. Here was the kicker. Uh, and some of your listeners may get a kick out of this. I raised competition chickens and that sounds goofy. If you ever watch the show chicken people, then you'll know. Uh, some of my birds were upwards of $900 a piece to $1,000 a piece. They were in a chicken coop that you had to be a person to get into. It had an electrified fence. It had an electrified baseboard, so mink couldn't get in. And the only way you could get into it was either turning, like opening a door or flipping a latch on the egg box and then opening that. So a couple of those birds went missing without a trace. Like I had all kinds of, like I had dollar chickens too, don't get me wrong. So if any of those went missing, I wouldn't know. You know, we had 100 of them. How would I know if two of them were gone, you know? As long as there wasn't 50 missing, I wasn't going to notice. But these guys were high-end uh, breeding birds for show, like dog shows, basically. Think of it like that. So when they went missing, it was a big deal. So we went over to the Amish, and we got a dog named Lucy. Lucy was a red healer, and Lucy was an absolute monster. So... If anybody knows, uh, if anybody's ever had a red healer, been around a red healer, they're extremely driven cattle dogs or farm protection dogs. So Lucy would patrol the tree line every night around the property. She was an incredibly vicious. Uh, she put all the animals in the barns at night, and then she'd walk the line. The one day we came home, and she was me and my mom came home, and Lucy was absolutely covered in blood, and we thought that something had tore her apart or whatever. We clean her up and we can't find anything really wrong with her besides a couple little cuts and bruises. My dad went in the woods and found two dead coyotes. So this dog was literally this little jacked monster. And then all the, well, we had Lucy for about a month and all the stuff stopped for a while. Like the stack stopped, the missing stuff stopped. But what Lucy was doing was walking the perimeter every night. And she would chase, let's say a raccoon or a possum or whatever was in the yard she would chase it back into the woods. Once it was in the woods, she'd stop chasing it. The problem would be if it hit the first tree on the tree line and then went up. So to Lucy, it never left. You know, it's still on the property. So she'd stand down there and bark and bark and bark. So me and my brother got used to having to go down and uh, knock. If it was a raccoon or a possum, we'd have to knock it out of a tree for her. Because if it, she didn't chase it off, she would literally stay there all night and bark. 
so yeah, we got pretty accustomed to this. So this dog stopped all the activity. So we, we were pretty sure just because she's a mean, nasty dog and whoever the guy was just didn't want to deal with a big, mean, nasty dog. And she she would let you pet her and whatever, but you know she was definitely a working animal. She had a job and she did, took it very seriously. So one night, she's barking. She's going out. It's probably about eleven thirty. And me and Luke go out into the garage and we get like a baseball bat and a golf club just to knock whatever we you know raccoon out of the tree. And as we get outside, standing in front of a tree. Uh, you remember I mentioned those four wheeler trails. So she's standing, it's like a hole in the woods. So she's standing in front of one of those, which is really weird because there's no trees there. She's also by one of the stadium lights. So we can't see into the woods, but there is that effect that's casted forward. Like fa- the lights kind of facing us. So you can't really see past the edge of the light very well. So me and Luke walk down and we get about 30 feet away from Lucy and we freeze. And I, I like Luke, Luke stopped the top and he had already seen it. Standing in like two or three feet in front of Lucy in this hole in the woods, about seven and a half foot off the ground, you just see these two giant chartreuse eyes. And they're looking down at Lucy. And they blink once really slow. And they blink twice really slow. And on the third blink, they're looking right at me and Luke. And I I just remember trying to just trying to tell Luke, don't, don't run, you know, don't run. And that lasted for about five feet. We came in the house, run, you know, we ran, we were balling, and my dad was done. He's like, I'm done. I've had enough with this guy. And he gets the shotgun and he walks. Lucy's still standing in the same spot barking. And he walks right there and he says, Okay, you MF or you know, you've you've tortured my kids, you tortured us for two years. I'm done with this. Uh and me and Luke were standing on the patio back behind him, probably about a hundred feet. He's like, I'm just done. You know, you're coming out of the woods right now. I'm gonna start shooting into it. You got to the count of three. And obviously he counts to three and nobody steps out. And so dad aims into the top of the tree and shoots just as a warning, you know, a scaring shot about 10 feet into the woods, right in front of dad. It sounds like a Buffalo is just ripping through the woods. Dad falls backwards and runs up to the house, but this thing, you just hear it taking off the woods, hitting trees, just destroying everything in its path. And all dad would say that night is it's not a man. It's not a man. It's not a man. So, me and Luke did see the outline of it. Like I didn't see full hair or anything like that, but you just seen this big hulking thing. Like it looked like a football player with the big shoulders, but it just was huge. I never looked down at the feet or nothing. You know, we were pretty on the eyes, you know, we were focused on these, the chartreuse eyes. So later that year, uh, all the sighting stops for the, like all, every, all the stuff stopped, you know, for the next couple months, my mom ended up getting cancer that year and we had to sell the farm and move into town. So, I don't know if he ever came back or not, but yeah, that's pretty much all the Bigfoot stuff. And I know that you guys were just kids, plus you're probably in shock because all of a sudden there's this other thing that's not a man. But like I said, you're just kids. So you before your dad pulled the gun and everything and you guys had run towards the house, did it cross your mind as well, the whole it's not a man because of where the eyes were sitting? So it was my, I was going to be, I always wanted to be a biologist and I was under the understanding for the longest time as biologists don't believe in Bigfoot. So I still probably didn't believe in Bigfoot for only two or three years after this event, but just the hulking, like it was just hulking and the eyes were, like, the eyes were probably three inches you know, apart from each other. So it's eyes were huge as well. And it's head was huge. I knew it wasn't a man. I didn't know what we seen until much later watching shows, you know, as goofy as they are, like mountain monsters and then like finding Bigfoot and seeing other people kind of take the subject seriously. Like we didn't talk about it for years. Me and my dad and my brother didn't talk, you know, but it was definitely whatever people are seeing that Bigfoot is, is what we seen. And it was, it had, uh, you know, the, we can talk about the flesh and blood and the woo side of it. Uh, no, I'm not discrediting the woo. But my encounter had only flesh and blood aspects. You know, it wanted chickens and it wanted horse feed for food, I'm assuming. And it was scared of the gun. You know, it was scared to be hurt and it wanted food. That's very flesh and blood things. But my dad knows it's a Bigfoot and we all know it's a Bigfoot now. But we really, and it, I think part of it fell on my mom getting cancer uh, later that year that we kind of stopped talking about it. You know, we never brought it back up for years. We didn't talk about it. 
And looking back, there was a lot of strange behaviors we did that we didn't realize we were doing. It's like we subconsciously always knew there was something out there. Like uh, me and my brothers were big raccoon hunters, and you do that at night. We had this big property. We never once hunted our property at night. We never did. We never stayed after dark. We never, you know, we hunted our property, but never at night. Why didn't we do that? And it was something me and my brother has talked about a lot is like, it just never felt right. It just was always that kind of weird feeling of like, well, no, we'll go down the road and we'll go hunt somebody else's property tonight. It had been 10 times easier to hunt ours because when we were done, we just walked back up to the house. There's just a lot of that kind of little weird stuff. And how long had you guys already lived there at the point uh, in the summer of 2011? Uh, so we moved in in 01. So we'd been there a long time. And all this stuff just kind of started up. So what's your theory on that? Do you think that they just happened to move into the area or what, or something set them off? Was there a change in the types of animals that you got or the type of feed that you got? Anything that you think would trigger this after all this time? So I have an opinion. And like I say, it's just an opinion. We started doing this show and we started as like doing a local Bigfoot club. And we got a lot of cool stuff, including a whole bunch of other sightings in 2012 within the next couple county roads. So two of these sightings were within a mile of where we had ours. And the one is Greg. He's in our intro. He, he, I've known him all my life, and he never told us he had a Bigfoot encounter until we started doing this stuff. So he has seen a seven and a half foot tall Bigfoot. He was driving. His dad had passed away, or was, his dad was passing away. And they were having to drive back and forth to the hospital all hours. So him and his sister went to the hospital one afternoon, and a farmer on our road had cows out. So, and it happens. So he's, you know, he's remembered that he gets out of the hospital probably about 2.30 in the morning, and he remembers there's cows out. So he's already kind of expecting there to be cows in this section of road, you know, just in case. You know, you don't want to hit a cow. So right near our house, he starts, he sees his cow in the ditch. And he starts slowing down. He's maybe going five or six miles an hour. He's going to stop and get this cow and just tie it up to the fence so whoever is looking for it in the morning can find it and so nobody else hits it. So as he's crawling and he gets within, you know, really close to this cow and the cow just starts standing up. And, it, and you listen to our intro. He's like, it kept going and going. And he gets to where he could pretty much, if he reached out his window, he could touch it. He's probably going two or three miles an hour. And he says it's about seven and a half foot tall. And he, he has probably one of the best descriptions of Bigfoot I've ever heard of him seeing it this close. But he focused on the teeth saying they look like chiclets. You know, it's what's something that really focused. And this Bigfoot let them fully pass. And then it took two steps. To, you know, it was into the woods on the other side. And then we had a couple other farmers who had seen similar things those years. And I personally think what was happening. So I'm a big proponent that at least some populations of Bigfoot are migratory. And when you say that, some people immediately jump on and say, well, what Bigfoot's not scared of the cold. You know, they live in Alaska and all that. And it's many animals migrate for many reasons. I think Bigfoot is food obligate migrants. So they, they migrate with food sources and reason, you know, seasonal availability, uh, specifically here in the Midwest. I think they're following the spring line down and the fall line or the spring line up and the fall line down. Uh, so the same Bigfoot that's seen in Toledo could be the same Bigfoot that's seen in Cincinnati, uh, you know, three, 400 miles, which when you look at stuff, species like elk and some big predators like mountain lions and stuff like that, that's not that big a distance for a large animal to travel in these migratory patterns. So why would they be migrating through Hardin County, Ohio? What's special about Hardin County, Ohio? Why did we have so many sightings in these, you know, these couple of years? It is where... The Ohio River watershed and the Lake Erie or the Great Lakes River watershed gets the closest. It gets to be about 300 yards apart from each other is here in Hardin County, Ohio. The two largest watersheds in the U.S. almost touch here in Hardin County. So I'm sure you've heard, but maybe, you know, some of your listeners, you know, about oh, there's a big belief that Bigfoot is using waterways to navigate or at least migrate. So for our part of the state, you know, most of these creeks and streams are six or seven foot down in the dirt, like they're low. So if you were eight, seven foot tall and you wanted to walk and not be seen, it's a perfect place to walk and not be seen. 
so to me, it speaks about a species that is using this as a migratory path, and this is the area they have to get out to cross and go down south. I think what happened was I'm a big believer in that they have at least small family groups. I think we were dealing with a juvenile male that decided not to migrate anymore and not spend his summers wherever the rest of them were going, probably down by Jake. And he stuck around and he, cause there's other farms and there was easy pickings, you know, he got it, you know, horse grain and chickens and rabbits and stuff. We had all kinds of people missing all kinds of stuff. You know, it's easy pickings. And then when his family would probably come back for the winter or back or heading down South for the winter, he just follow him back down. So he'd leave for the winter months and come when it was summer months and he was passing through, he'd just stay around. Now the second year, I think he was getting a lot bolder with just how big the structures were getting where all this stuff was, I think he was trying to push us off and say, no, this stuff's mine. You know, here's my, you know, here's how big and strong I am. And then that dog ruined everything for him that he couldn't get onto our property anymore and he couldn't do it. But I think Lucy was probably about two minutes away from not being a dog anymore to where if we weren't, and I don't think we personally were in danger as kids but I think that dog was about to not be a dog. And I think once dad shot in the air, that was it. I think uh, whether you want to believe they have language or communication abilities, you know, how complex you want to believe they are, you know, the warnings his parents had probably given him about humans all came true. And they all stopped. Like in our county, there was no more sightings anymore, you know, since then. It was a big high spike in those two years in our county. Uh, which to me points, and we didn't know this for years, to points that it was probably at least, I personally think it was one individual that was getting lazy and was enjoying all the extra sugary foods and the easy foods and that kind of stuff. And then it all came crashing down when he got shot at. That's just an opinion. That gives me chills though, because uh, seven and a half feet tall and yet you're classifying him a juvenile, you know, that's oh, yeah. awesome. And why I say juvenile is more because the behaviors. A lot of the decisions seemed rash, like when it would come in and the stacking, like some of the stacks were, you know, 30 feet from the front door of the house. We could be out at any time. You know, we, we had a, a large herd of goats and when they were given birth, you know, we, it wasn't on for us to go out to the barn at two in the morning or three in the morning, you know? So it just was a lot of reckless on what I think, and I say male just because to me, when we seen it, it looked very masculine. It could have been a female. I have no idea. But to, we always have called it a boy. So that's what I always, I'm stuck in my head now. But it seemed just a lot of reckless decisions. Screams to me, teenager, you know, that kind of behaviors, getting lazy, taking the easy way. And then he got shot at. And he really, my dad didn't shoot at him. You know, he shot up in the air. But, to it, you know, it was might as well have been shot at. And then all that stuff came flooding back. Okay, people are, you know, people are dangerous. People can be really dangerous. But Greg had his encounter, and a couple other local farmers had their encounters. Two of the farmers just seen them stand in the field when they were harvesting grain. So it just was looking at them. It's just it, very odd behaviors. But I really think it was about to kill that dog. Uh, I mean, we how many stories have you heard? I've heard, you know, that where the dog gets punted or the dog, you know, the dog goes missing. Dogs ripped in half. Yeah. It's not, yeah. not a good situation. Sometimes they, they, they do not like being uh, pointed out when they don't want to be pointed out. If they want you to see them, that's their choice, but they don't, they don't want to be called out. Okay. Plenty of questions. Sorry. I, no, I talk a lot. no, no, it's, it's perfect. It's awesome. I just, you know me, I'll be jotting stuff down. I've got a lot of questions. So, the event with your dad, after mm -hmm. that happened, as far as the, the gun going off, did that create or alter restrictions for some of you kids as far as you going in or near the woods? Did that alter daily life on the farm? Yeah. Oh, yeah. My dad, what, like, my, my littlest siblings weren't allowed to do anything on the farm. Like, they weren't allowed to go out. And we were only there for a couple more months. Uh, like I said, my mom got very, you know, sick, right? She's in remission. She's good now. But she got, you know, she had cancer. So it's just the older siblings were out, allowed to go out and take care of stuff. And then I don't ever remember him telling us we weren't allowed to be out at night. But I'll tell you what, we were never out at night. None of us were. Uh, it just, it was, 
it was just a weird thing. I, I kind of forgot to mention, this is why I wish Jay was sitting in here, is my aunt and uncle were living with us at the time, and my uncle had ended up having his own encounter. He never told about us till like, last year. He didn't, like, he, he they moved to Florida right after, so we didn't we get to see him a whole lot. But he liked to play, uh, he liked baseball, and we're not a big sports family. And he want you know, a bunch of kids and stuff like that. So he would go sit out the, in this driveway in the middle and well, listen to his baseball game in the car radio. Well, we're all watching TV and one night. We see him, you know, he's probably four or 500 yards away, but we can see his headlights. And we just see him peel out of the driveway and he leaves for like two hours. And he comes back and he's like, my aunt's asking him, you know, where'd you go? And he's like, I went to get ice cream. And she was all upset because she's like, why didn't you get the kids ice cream? Like, you know, that's very selfish of you to leave for hours. Go get yourself ice cream. And, you know, and he wouldn't really want to talk about it. So he finally told us why. He was sitting there listening to the baseball game. And he said he felt something huge run up on him. It slapped the trunk of his car like the whole car bounced and kept running. He never seen it. And he just put it in gear and took off and left for hours and wouldn't come back. So that was another weird little thing that happened in the middle of all of this. I believe that. So he was in the middle of the woods when this happened. And I'm sorry, I think it cut you off. When Do you know what month and year that was? That would be in 2011, and that would have been in the summer. Wow. That would have been before my knocking thing, so probably June. So can you describe as much as you can whatever details that you remember, length of hair for whatever you want to call it, color, anything you remember? So, yeah, it was more, I guess I, we've more seen the silhouettes, you know, so I didn't get a lot of that great detail. The eyes are really what will always stick in my head, and they were humongous, you know, th- at least three, three and a half inches apart, these big chartreuse eyes, and that was shining, you know, reflecting the light from the, the stadium. Like, but that was casting, like, I'm sure everybody's seen that phenomenon where you're looking like a big beam of light's coming down, you're trying to look through the light on the other side, and you get that weird, like, haze effect. That's basically what we were seeing. Uh, but we seen the outline of its head, and it just was this big, massive head on these, like, big shoulders. We couldn't see musculature, but it looked like one of those big football players. And then I never looked past, like, the belly and the arms because we took off running. And my brother Luke will rarely talk about it, and I don't know if he's seen any more than I did or not, but these just – these eyes were massive. In the lucid percutum, the, the, the organ that reflects eyes is very, very rare in primates. You really only find it in very ancient primates like lemurs, for example. Uh, no great apes have that. And it's just, to me, as you know, being a biologist, it was a very unique thing much later on in life, seeing that green eye shine or that eye reflection. But, I mean, I don't, I'm not one of the few that have a very good detailed description, like seeing it physically. But it was hulking, and it had these big green eyes. So it was like Jay Cutler was standing in your woods. Yeah. Or Shaq or somebody. Yeah, much taller Jay Cutler. I don't think Jay Cutler's super tall, but he's a wide dude. Yeah. Yeah, and it was it was it looked like football pads. It really did. It didn't look it it looked really odd. And by the time we got to the house, me and my brother were in tears. You know, I was 17 at the time. We were in tears. And my dad just thought it was a guy up, you know, up until that. And my dad will talk about it now, but, you know, for years we didn't. And he's pretty sure it was a Bigfoot as well. He never got to see it, but that's the noise. And I've been asked before whether we went and looked for prints or anything like that. We were not Bigfoot people. You know, we didn't go. We, you know, we were done. When this thing crashed in the woods, we, I remember going down and we seen it. It looked like it made a new, like there were small trees broken and dead wood falling and stuff like that. And like a lot of the, the underbrush was just destroyed. But I don't remember if there was footprints or anything like that. Yeah, I would imagine, especially after the experiences, especially you personally, because now this is the second time this essentially rogue Bigfoot has had you in tears, which sucks because you're at home. You're supposed to feel safe. I can't imagine you'd be like, OK, time to go get the let's get get a camera and some plaster of Paris and go find some footprints of this dude. You probably mm-hmm. didn't want to have anything to do with it. How how old were you guys at this point, Justin? And And were you before all this began? Were you even aware of Bigfoot? So we were aware of Bigfoot, but like I said, I was I was always going to be a biologist. That's what I had a room full of animals and I had all this stuff. So I was under the impression forever biologists don't believe in Bigfoot. And uh, so I was 
a 16 and 17, the years it happened. So Luke would have been, he's always two years younger than me. So he'd been, you know, 14 and 15. I just, we, I still didn't believe in Bigfoot. Pro. Like I was using everything to rationalize it wasn't Bigfoot. And now it's funny going to school and doing all the biology stuff. Bigfoot makes a lot more sense than anything else. You know, growing up, it was the thing I was trying to rationalize away. And now it's the only thing that rationally fits. So Luke was 14 or 15, a little younger. So even to this day, he's not real keen on talking about it that much. I've only ever gotten to talk about it three times since then. Yeah. And it's just to him. So he he's had a lot rougher life than I have. You know, he's got muscular dystrophy. That's the brother with muscular dystrophy. And then, you know, mom got cancer that year. And then he's, you know, started, that's kind of the years he started going downhill with some of his problems. So it was just a really hard time for him in general. Plus seeing a Bigfoot on top of it was just probably a little too much. Yeah, that's uh, the monster in the woods, right? It's not something you're, you're quite expecting. Do you, does there, is there any part of you that wishes, and I think I know the answer because of the reaction and I totally understand the reaction. Is there any part of you maybe today that says, gosh, it would have been cool to see the Bigfoot in, in daylight. So I could see more than a silhouette. I personally, and me and Jay talk about this a lot. I have all I need to know they're real and I'm good. I, I know Bigfoot. I don't believe Bigfoot hunts people, at least in general, you know, I'm sure there's a, a bad apples out there like anything, but seeing something like that, especially that young would have probably put me off forever. I probably would have changed everything about me. I'm good. I don't need to see them anymore. I know they're real and that's enough. And I never blame anybody else. Cause I worked in biology labs and stuff. I never blamed anybody else for not believing Bigfoot without seeing one. Cause it's, it's a hard thing to believe that there's an eight foot tall man like thing running around in the woods of Hardin County, Ohio, until you realize a whole bunch of people seen it. Yeah. When you're talking about eyes that are three plus inches apart. I mean, when you actually measure that out, I mean, that would essentially be where my temples are on the side yeah. of my head. I mean, that, it's insane yeah, to I, think about that. So I get it. You're like, I, I saw enough to know that was mm -hmm. not a dude screwing around in the woods. And for everybody at home, like you look at the, some of the biggest mountain lions on the planet, most of their eye spreads are two and a half inches. So it's, you know, we're talking really large eye spread. You know, for especially for a front facing animal. Yeah. It's that's that's really far apart. It's humbling. Very. And then add the seven and a half feet tall on top of it. Okay, so and and forget the dark scenario, but I do want to ask you, since you're a biologist and I want your opinion, I know you've heard all of the different scenarios. So if we're going off this quote unquote, let's call him a rogue, right? Like you said, mm -hmm. he's dispensed with the group, he's doing his own thing. Let's go dark for a second. Let's talk about, do you think then that since he is more, maybe even more of an opportunist than his uh, group, his family group, do you think it's possible that a Bigfoot, not, maybe not that specific one, but does Bigfoot get that opportunity to take that lone hiker, you know, and, and he travels down to Salt Fork and there's some rando on a trail and, and scoops him away into some cave somewhere. Do you think that's going on with any Bigfoot? I think it's very regionalized if that is happening. Uh, Cause it, when you look at this, we're going to look at food availability. Uh, we use mountain lions for an example, you know, generally speaking, mountain lions refuse to prey on people because they know it's not worth the time. You know, if you kill one person, more people are coming. It's not, it's not worth it. It's like killing a dog, uh, you know, a pack of, you know, wolves or whatever. It's just for these predator, predatory species. Uh, for that individual, I personally don't think we were in any danger because uh, he could have grabbed us at any time way before that. You know, we were kids all over this massive property by ourselves all the time. If he wanted to get one of us, he would have got one of us. That's been my opinion now, looking back, you know, years later, as far as, I think what the only Bigfoot you'd have to really be scared of as far as that kind of factor is where calories are hard to come by. Uh, when you look at the Alaskan Bigfoots, you know, they're generally a lot larger and a lot more aggressive. And, you know, Alaska has the most missing people of anywhere in the world. And I think there may be this small, and I, I think there could be an opportunity for a small percentage of those people being taken by Sasquatch because they're calorie dependent. You know, 
in the harsh, harsh winters, calories are hard to come by. Here in the Midwest, calories are easy, especially when, you know, if you're a Bigfoot, whether I don't think they're hunting deer, you know, every day or nothing like that, because there's much smaller prey that is easier to obtain and much smaller food sources that are easier to obtain. So for a Bigfoot to be preying on a person, I think it would be desperate times. I do. I think it has happened, but I don't think there's any out there, at least most likely there's any out there that are targeting people. But like I said, in every group of every animal, including us, there's bad apples. You know, you get one out there that could, you know, Ape Canyon incident, you know, is shot at, you know, injured, uh, like tigers, for example. There's that one tiger that was, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember her name, in India. She was shot by a hunter. It broke her jaw, and she killed, she's believed to kill up to a 1,000 people. She wiped out three small villages out of anger. So there's all this stuff that can happen, you know, these weird occurrences. But I think in general, though, as long as you're not in Alaska or you're not probably in the northern part of Canada, I don't think they're actively looking to prey upon people, if that makes any sense. Do you think then, in your professional opinion, does that speak to their intelligence in the fact that they would know, oh, well, when I take one of these, there's a whole bunch more that are, are going to come around with the bang sticks? I Yes, I do. And I know this is all opinionated, but... I think they're very intelligent. I think, you know, they're close to us. Whether they're genetically close to us or not, it's a different thing. But I think intelligence-wise, they're very close to us. But if we even put them as smart as a mountain lion or a big cat, you know, big cats are famous for avoiding people because they know we're bad news. So I'll tell you a story. I have a big cat researcher friend. Uh, she was working out west. She tagged an old mountain lion. So she tranked out this mountain lion and put a radio collar on her. Never found her again. She'd get within 30 feet and never see it to get the collar back off. And eventually, you know, months and months later, the bad, the, the collar died and she never found that mountain lion again. So that mountain lion had one bad experience with a person one time. She could never let another person see it again, no matter mm -hmm. how close they got. So if you want to say Bigfoot's even as smart as just a mountain lion, you know, they know people are not good news, especially when they're aggravated. You know, they've watched and, you know, they're called the watchers for a reason. They know. So, yeah, I think they are intelligent enough to be like, yeah, people are probably not the best thing. And then yeah, we want to call them, uh, they're probably megafauna from the last ice age. You know, they're over 600 pounds, at, you know, probably. I haven't weighed one much, but I think I, I'm going to say, yeah. So meg, any megafauna that survived the last ice age had to deal with humans immediately after. And the only ones that survived, you look at Africa and some of the North American ones are the ones that are the most adept with dealing with people. The rest of them, you know, like the short-faced bears and giant ground sloths and stuff like that, we actively killed to get rid of them because they were threats to us. So if you were that kind of animal and you were smart enough to witness, hey, they're killing everything that appears to be a threat, you know, it's probably not good. Uh, jaguars here in the U.S., you know, most people don't realize jaguars are native, and this is an argument in biology, but jaguars are native to the U.S. Some ancient historic put them all the way up to Ohio being native, most other estimates put them down in the south, being native. We were scared of jaguars. We killed every one of them. Every jaguar we found, we killed it. We specifically hunted them out to wipe out any any chance of them being a predator. And now you look at big cats. You know, we're trying to get mountain lions. We're trying to study these things. And they are some of the hardest animals to find on the planet. So if you're a little more intelligent and you've seen all this or you experienced all of this and you don't want to be found, are you going to be found? Now, while this dude is hanging around your particular swath of woods, have you thought about essentially where his living room would have been during that time? Like, where would the no zone be if you were traipsing through the woods? You know, do you think that that, that, that existed? Like, would he have had a nest somewhere? Where do you think that would have been? I think I know exactly where it was. Because we used to go there as kids and as we, like little kids, and as we got older, we stopped going there. But there, in the middle of this big woods, uh, there's a really tall, s steep embankment. And on top of this, there's uh, like two abandoned houses and then a brick foundation. Fully abandoned, like they're, you know, they're decrepit, don't get me wrong, but we'd go inside them as kids and play in them. And then all of a sudden we stopped doing that. We even stopped going to that whole section of woods, even to squirrel hunt during the day. Why is that? And, that was, and this is way know. before all the Bigfoot stuff started? Why did you stop? Yeah. We don't know. Huh. It was just... It's just one of these things like odd behaviors we realized we were doing that we don't, we can't explain. Right. It's almost, and I don't know if they were, the whole group was using it as, you know, cover 
because it's it's a big woods, but it, there's not a lot of cover. You know, if ten people go in there, it'd be very hard for an animal of that size to hide. You know, effectively, especially if there's a group of them. So you think he might have actually been set up inside one of the abandoned houses? That or th- this big foundation was basically like a cave. You know, the, they had the floor, and then you could go into the basement. Oh, okay, right. Oh God, so, that's creepy. Oh, can you imagine? Oh, yeah. We used to turkey hunt out of it as kids, and then we stopped. Yeah, that that sixth sense kicked in somehow, right? Your your self preservation sense. And then there's all these stories with infrasound, and you know, a lot of animals produce infrasound. You know, big cats, elephants. You know, large large mammals produce infrasound, and it can create all kinds of effects on humans. And one of them is just making humans leave. It can cause unease and you know irritability, and it can just a low level of it can make you leave. So there's always that idea in play that, you know, they kind of want you to move on without really making it known that they're there. You know, they do this low infrasound burst and just get you kind of moving out of the area. But you don't consciously recall, and I know it was a long time ago, and you're just a kid out playing, but you don't consciously recall a, a, a specific event where you felt intense unease or you felt sick or nauseous or you you know you had this quote-unquote thought in your head like i should we should go and never come back yeah nothing that intense it was much more passive which is a thing you start looking at whales and stuff like that they make passive infrasounds and much low you know much lower volumes of infrasound it's not like the suicide cliffs out in california or anything like that did you guys ever find any dead chickens or chicken, forgive me, but chicken parts anywhere on the property after these guys would go missing? So we had, uh, of the expensive chickens, no. But, you know, there was other predators. We had a farm, and, you know, sometimes they'd come in the coop and there'd be a whole bunch of feathers. You know, that's foxes and coyotes and that kind of stuff. Of the high-end chicken, I could, I could actually point out as a person had to open that to get to them. And then closed it back. And it was closed every time after. So, it, you know, it was something consciously taking stuff and then putting stick and putting it back. So we never found any of those birds, no. I don't know if it's creepy, cool, or maybe both. Uh, and I don't know if this was just a foresight to keep the chickens in. Because he, he knew, like, these need to stay here for the next time I want to come get them. Or was he trying to cover tracks somehow for you guys to close the pen back up? Well, you know, well, that's interesting that he would even care to do such a thing. And yeah, I, I've gone back and forth over the years about what is the, the goal. And I personally, I think it's more to not be caught immediately or not to have too many like weird things. But he was also in that same pasture putting up gigantic, you know, structures. Right. So is it more like you're saying, you know, is it more just make sure the food's here next time? You know, if I leave a door open, you know, these chickens are going to go everywhere. Yeah, that's that is so interesting. And it, it definitely speaks to uh, higher intelligence. Keep the goods where they need to be for next time. That was that's where my mind also went with that. OK, so you mentioned it early on. So let's talk about why you feel that Bigfoot does, in fact, match biological data that we have. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so. Bigfoot makes biological sense. So when I was working at it, the company I worked for as a biologist, uh, there was a guy that was a calorietician. And there's a couple different types of calorieticians. So what he would do, or his job, is he would go into an environment and he would establish how many calories are available on like the food pyramid for wildlife. You know, apexes, second level, ape, you know, all that stuff. So his job was to do that. One day we're sitting in the lab, in the field lab, talking i'm talking about bigfoot to all these you know these field techs and stuff and he comes in and he's like how oh, bigfoot's just bullcrap you know there's nothing really there and i'm like yeah it's fine you know whatever and then he leaves about two or three weeks later uh he hands me a stack of papers and he's like oh here's how many of them could be if they're twice the size of a black bear on average and they have a similar diet explanations and I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, there could be on the low end, and that's been 15,000 of them per for the U.S. continent. On a high end, 45,000 of them. And he had, I have all the paperwork. And we are actually, we were supposed to present it this year at the Hocking Hills Bigfoot Conference, and we're going to do it next year at the festival for Hocking Hills. But he handed me this big stack of paperwork. 
basically what it was explaining is if a black if a bigfoot is on average about twice the size of an adult black bear so you know 600 to 800 pounds it has a similar diet which we'll break down here in a minute there could be anywhere from 15,000 of them to 45,000 of them there's actually an available niche for these guys so the evidence that 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 data is pointing at that there is an opening a job opening for an animal of that size here in North America. It's actually, uh, for us, it looks like it's missing. But if you want to believe Bigfoot's real, then it, you know, that's what, that's right where he slides in. So does 45,000 sound like a lot of them? I mean, to me, it does. So what I use, for example, imagine if there was 45,000 elephants in the wilderness of Canada and you had to find that, well, you had to find one. It's extremely hard. It's not a big number. Uh, 45,000 is, and it's a healthy breeding population as long as they're migratory. That was the other factor. As long as they're moving around for genetics. It's just not a lot. You know, it's, it breaks it down. It's just, and then on the low end, if there's only 15,000 of them, it's not a lot. So I always say, I like to say there's probably 25,000 of them out there. And a lot of people are seeing the same Bigfoot. So there's 25,000 of them. That's 500 per state. So in that, but that, that data is counting Canada as well. So that number goes down dramatically. Mm. So now we're looking at them where it's just, there's not a ton of them. You know, we're talking maybe 300 or 400 on average per state. It's just, they're there genetically. They're, they're in a healthy position, but there's try to find 400 animals in the state of Utah or, you know, 400 animals in the state of Michigan. It's extremely hard to do, uh, but that niche is available. So there's an opening. So do you have any questions about that before I go into diet? Uh, how do you suppose if we go like take the, take the low, low bet on that, mm -hmm. how would they be able to, especially when you're talking about migration and all of this, how do they avoid inbreeding so that they don't just decimate themselves at some point? Perfect question. So we're looking at big cats again. We're going to use big cats and black bears a lot today. Uh, so big cats have this phenomenon where cubs of a female will set up territory right next to their mother's territory. You know, they, they are, they'll stay and they'll even, you'll see like, for example, mountain lions and tigers will keep running back into their daughters and mothers and be okay. Males have the, the, the desire to just go great distances. So uh, the one tagged uh, bobcat cub from Kentucky ended up almost to Michigan in one year. So it almost went 350 miles away from its mother's territory in one year. And they, this is a big common thing in big cats to prevent inbreeding. So these big cat males specifically will go and find territories way off from their mother's territory. For Bigfoots, I think it's something a little more on the lines with elephants and such, where they're migrating for what I believe are breeding areas. And when you look at, I use Hocking Hills as my example. If you look at most Ohio Bigfoot sightings, they're like what I just told you. You know, they're the passing sightings. They're not very scary when you really break them down. Hocking Hills is special, though. Hocking Hills has tons and tons and tons of extremely scary encounters. They're shaking trees. They're throwing stuff at you. You know, they're following you all the way to the car, all the way to your campsite. I think it's a breeding area or a birthing area, and they are being much more scary to keep you away from their little secret areas. So what elephants will do is when it's, you know, time to breed and stuff like that, they'll gather up in big groups to help switch around genetics. So let's say a bunch of these Bigfoot that live in Ohio and parts of Michigan and Indiana go to Hocking Hills, not every year, but when it's their time to reproduce or when their time to find a mate, they'll go down that area and they'll select. And I think there's something like that, you know, going on. And I think these little areas are spread out throughout the country. Uh, and you look at some of the Native American legends with, you know, Sasquatch, they have these kind of similar stories to where like the Bigfoot powwows, you know, out West and stuff like that, where these Bigfoot will all come down out of the hills and the mountains for, you know, a couple weeks out of the year to hang out. And uh, I believe it was territory of the river King was like one of the, these things where they would all come down. And this guy was talking about that. They would see what Bigfoots didn't survive in what areas. And then young Bigfoot would go take over their territory after the winter. So there's all these ideas that it depends on really how smart you want to put them. If they know they don't need, to, they know they have to avoid inbreeding, or even if they're just animals, that animals have this kind of built-in thing. Uh, for mammals, most of the number is 5,000. As long as you have 5,000 or more, you have enough genetic diversity to keep breeding. And as long as you're migrating far enough that the genetics are spreading across, 
the plane. Does that make sense or did I just ramble? No, that is that is awesome. Thank you so much for answering that. By the way, guys, you heard it here. Uh, I'm Well, I'm sure you've said it many times on your show, but for those ITFers, go to Hawking Hills, but take your adult diapers. It's seriously, we go down and I'll give you guys one. I'll give you guys one area. Conkles Hollow. If you ever down there, go in. You're allowed to go to the park at some parts at night. There's a lot of really scary, and they don't hurt anybody, you know, at least we don't hear about those stories. They, I don't, maybe they don't, you know, maybe they're not right. coming back. But it really seems like the one, like Hocking Hills State Park, there was at least three or four stories I can think of off the top of my head where basically they were walking on the backside of the park, you know, and they got, they went over one ridge and one too far and all, all the trees and they get left charged and all this stuff and they follow them all the way back to their tent. And then they, they scream at them all night and scare them all night, throw stuff at them all night. There was one guy that uh, he, you know, got in the car and they were still throwing stuff at his car. And it just seems to me to be much more get you out of here behavior. They're not hurting you. You know, if, I, I'm a big believer. If a Bigfoot's winging a rock at you, if it hits you, if it wanted to hit you, it would hit you. If it's not hitting you, it's just trying to scare you. It's trying to get you moving because there's all these stories of them being extremely accurate with these rocks. So it just seems to me like they're really just want you to move and leave the area. All right, so you mentioned diet. So let's hear about these guys and their diet. All right, so let's break down black bear diet. Here's probably not my biggest problem with the Bigfoot thought right now in the community, but I think the biggest misnomer is that Bigfoot, we have a, like our talk is called Bigfoot Big Diet. You see these big hulking, what we're going to call animals. You know, let's say an eight foot tall Bigfoot is probably 800 pounds. There's not a pound per inch growth chart. So when you look at like alligators and stuff like that, there's not like they don't grow an extra every you know foot. They don't grow an extra hundred pounds. It's actually exponential. So you know that one inch may be a hundred pounds, and then the next two you know the next inch may be two hundred pounds, and so on and so forth. So a ten foot tall Bigfoot would be somewhere around fifteen to sixteen hundred pounds if we have if we think we conventionally understand how tall or how much an eight foot Bigfoot weighs. So these guys are eating a lot, right? These guys are big animals. You know, we're talking stuff that are in between gr- black bear and grizzly bear in size. I'm a big believer that Bigfoot are omnivores like us, and so are black bears. So about 60% of a black bear's diet is foliage, is plant matter, whether it's tubers, roots, you know, all that stuff. They're eating plants. They're eating a lot of plants. But only 40% of their diet is protein. Of that 40%, almost all of it comes from protein sources smaller than your hand. Mm. So not saying a black bear, a four or 500 pound black bear is not capable of hunting a deer, is capable of catching a salmon. It's hard work. So there's this cost effectiveness, this cost versus reward thing. So if a black bear is hunting a deer, it's spending a lot of calories to chase that deer, track that deer, kill that deer, and then break down and digest that deer. By the end of it, it's not gaining a whole lot. What most black bears do, and actually the company I worked for, it was one of the ones that did the study, was in, specifically in Michigan. They will walk down creeks, and they will mostly eat frogs all summer. And they get almost the same level of calories out of about 100 frogs as they do out of one deer. So what is easier for this black bear to do every day? Is it easier for it to walk down this creek and catch 100 frogs? Or is it easier to try to track, hunt, kill, and digest and break down this deer? That's a lot easier to do the frogs. Kids catch frogs. Kids don't catch a deer. So, and then the amphibian base. So these little animals reproduce fast and they produce a lot of biological mass. And some of these environments, amphibians and invertebrates make up the majority of the mass of life. So if you're this big hulking creature and you need to eat, you need to eat, you have to eat small things. Not saying a Bigfoot can't kill an elk, can't kill a deer, but an elk's a big animal. You know, it's going to, it has just as high a chance of hurting you back as you hurting it. And, you know, deer, same way, you know, deer would be not hard for a Bigfoot to kill. I'm not saying that, but it's just the cost effectiveness. So if we're looking at this, if they're like us and they're like black bears, they're mostly probably going to eat plant matter. You know, they're eating a lot of foliage, they're eating a lot of, you know, berries and all that stuff. And then when they're eating protein, they're collecting invertebrates and they're collecting crayfish and they're collecting these amphibians and frogs. There's so much food there to support these guys that it's ridiculous to think that they're out hunting an elk every other day. I mean, if we're believing that there's, you know, 600 pound animals in these family groups, that's a lot of food needed. And they're really the only thing that could support it is rodents, amphibians, and invertebrates. 
And yet another the, reason they're sticking around the waterway. So it's it's two birds, one stone. It's easy to move through. And they're usually down in a ravine, out of sight, and there's food. Exactly. So there's all these biological data points you can really look at and point at and say, look, Bigfoot makes biological sense. Uh, when you look at stuff like grizzly bears, grizzly bears have a little more of a carnivorous diet, but they're still eating a lot of foliage. They're still eating a lot of plants. They hunt, they'll hunt, you know, elk calves, they'll hunt moose calves. They're capable of killing an adult moose. They don't. You know, it's very, very rare for a big grizzly bear to go toe-to-toe with a big moose because it's just as likely, you know, who's going to die in this fight? You know, it could be really either side. You know, and they'll eat calves and stuff like that, but why would they? You know, why would you go out of your way to kill this big hulking moose or this big hulking elk? And they'll, they will, and they'll try it, and they get desperate. And that's the other thing we talked about way earlier with people is that, I don't care how smart the animal is, including us. When you're desperate, you're desperate. And your your opinions and your rules in your head start changing dramatically. Well, and this actually goes right along with your property because it it would come in and now it, it's few and far between as far as the horses go. And we've heard some very strange stories as far as horses getting their hair braided and all that stuff. I don't know what to make of that, but... You had horses, you had goats, and then you had the chickens. And it would come in, and it chose the chickens, the smallest of the protein source. And now, I don't know what the setup was with the goats, and obviously, I'm sure you would have mentioned it had you been missing a goat or two. Of course, you said you had 100 of them, right? But I would imagine you oh, would notice if a, yeah, if we a goat had a goat. My mom would have known. Yeah. I gotta, goats are cool. Like, I, I, I sure that, that she had her favorites, and she knew them all. So... I mean, that goes, like, I was just, that was my point, I guess. It goes yeah. right along with what you're saying as far as the, the scale of what they're actually coming in for. So, yeah, I guess, and you're 100% right. And because they could have just grabbed the goats, they were in the same pasture as the chickens. Like, it's not hard to, it's not hard to take a goat, but it's more along the lines of what we think they're eating. And then the, the game birds we didn't even touch on and stuff like that, these small birds. It just, I'm, I guess I'm just trying to make the point that there, there's a, this biological niche, that a job opening for these animals to exist that is proven is vacant. You know, we're missing this animal in the environment, at least most, in most of the U.S. They don't have to be killing elk every day. They don't have to be killing moose and killing black bear every day, you know, to eat these big massive amounts of protein. Yeah, they're eating frogs and amphibians and these other in, in then invertebrates. You know, a big part of black bears' diets are invertebrates, are ants and grubs and all this stuff. So, you know, these 900 pound pigs are the same way. You know, you can get to be 900 pounds eating roots and grubs. You know, as long as you can find them and smell them, it's not hard to do. So, there's just this availability for this animal to exist in this way. And I know we haven't talked about the woo at all. We've had people on our show. You've had people on your show with the woo side of Bigfoot. That's real too. It's just I can't speak upon that because that's not what I've seen. Yeah, and I definitely want to at least get your opinion on that. But before we do, I mean, unless you're Coyote Peterson and can come across an entire Bigfoot skull, uh, I know that, and that's, of course, tongue-in-cheek, because he did not. Why Why no bones? I know you've gotten this before. It's come up, I'm sure, a hundred times. Perfect. Why has yep. and no one come across a big old pile of abnormally large bones, large enough to where even, even someone that has no interest in bones or Bigfoot or anything would go, this is weird. Of course, they would think it was a big person maybe and call 911 anyway, but... I'm getting at what is what is your go-to answer for that as far as why is there not enough bones to where we can then prove Bigfoot at least with that? That's perfect. And I'll do that one, and then I'll do the camera one if you want. Yes, please. All right. So we actually, again, biology can explain this. It depends on where you're at in the country. But now I'm trying to remember this county in Alaska. So we used it. We actually did an episode called Where's the Bodies? Nine, if you, most of the time, if you're going to find it, you're not going to find a whole skeleton of a Bigfoot if they just go out there and die. Scavengers are going to pull them apart. And how's anybody, the normal person, going to tell an elk bone from a Bigfoot bone? You know, elk are humongous animals. You know, they're 900 pounds, 1,000 pounds, and, you know, 10 foot tall. And then moose are even bigger than bison. You know, so you know, we have these megafauna left in the U.S. But an elk in, or an elk in Northern California in the rainforest took, I believe it was 14 day time lapse to be completely gone between scavengers and insects breaking down the carcass. 
So if you're looking for an animal that's 900 pounds in the, you know, in the specific rainforest, you have 14 days to walk across its body. Now, when a thing with predators, though, is when predators are wounded and predators are dying, they all do this thing. And not all, all, but most, when we look at canids and big cats and even the primates, they will go and find a hole so deep or so far off to die in because they don't want to be picked apart while they're dying. You know, scavengers a lot of times will not wait. I mean, how many videos in nature have you seen of an animal actively dying and stuff that's already ripping out its guts? Mm -hmm. So if you're smart enough to realize, hey, I really, I've done that to things. I really, like a wolf, I don't really want that to happen to me. So I'm going to go curl up in a den and die somewhere. So let's say Bigfoot's a little, like, a little smarter and doing the same thing. If it's hurt or it's injured, it's going to go crawl in a hole or cave or something and die back there. So in this one county in Alaska has the most grizzly bears on the planet. It's, I believe, 35,000 grizzly bears in the whole county. Uh, it's, I believe, it's, I'm not sure if it's on Kodiak Island now or not. I think it may be. So there's this guy we used for this, this episode. He is the head grizzly bear researcher for this county in Alaska. He has been there for 15 years. He has only ever found two dead grizzly bears. And around 4 to 8% of the population dies every year. So that's, you know, it's a thousand dead grizzly bears, and he's only ever found two, two carcasses. And one of them had a radio transmitter collar on it, is the only reason he found that one. So these grizzly bears are humongous, hulking animals, and there's tons and tons and tons of them. And he's out there every day monitoring the population and stuff. He's only ever walked upon two carcasses. So for us to think, let's say there's 25,000 of them, and 4% of the population is dying every year, so a couple hundred of them are dying. So now you have a couple hundred bodies to find on the U.S. continent. And now they're, in high, they're slightly intelligent like other carnivores or other omnivores, and they're in a hole somewhere, or they're in a gully, or they're in this cutback. You're not going to find them. Or if you do find a bone, you're finding a piece of a bone or one single bone, and there's probably somebody's got a, like a drawer of bones, and there's a Bigfoot femur sitting in the middle of it he thinks is an elk bone. So it's just the odds game for me explaining it like that you know there's twenty five thousand animals spread out four percent of the population is dying it's a couple hundred animals a year there's just not that many bodies out there you know it's not like they're raining from the sky and we've had some people you know try to argue with us on this you know that's a big one you have a non-believer come up where are all the bodies where are all the bodies there's just not that many of them dying and nature breaks down a carcass extremely fast it's just, it's that, I mean, does that make sense? hundred percent. And scoptics take that. I love it. Uh, yeah, I think even Cliff mentioned at some point that it, it takes six months or less for an entire elephant carcass to be completely gone. And that's, I mean, that, that's in, insane. insane. It's probably way less than that even. I think, I, I forget exactly the number that he said, but it was six months or less. And it really depends on where they're at in the world as well. Right. You know, I, I of a rainforest example but if you die in a wooded area as long as you're not dying in the middle of a cornfield nobody's gonna find these bodies right and they stink, they only stink for a couple of days you know once they pop and stuff like that they they pretty much aren't reeking anymore like uh hunting for when you know we've had to help locals retrieve deer that you know they shot and they couldn't find and you wait you get like a couple day window where the deer will start stinking so you can go try to find it and then after that you know it's gone and that's a deer that they shot is in this little field or in this little woods in Hardin County. And we still can't find its body. Thoughts on the theory that they bury their dead. And that's, so it really depends. I have no proof to say they do that, but they are intelligent and whether they're doing it for ceremony, like we do, or if they're doing it for protection, because they're smart enough to realize, Hey, you know, we don't want to be found out. Uh, you're not going to find any bodies. I mean, you're just not going to, if I don't think that ha they have to, because I know that was a big thing in the, especially in the eighties and the nineties where they, that was the big push to say like, look, they're burying their dead. That's why we're not finding bodies. With what I just laid out, I don't think they have to be burying their bodies for us not to find them. Right. I do think they are intelligent enough that that may be something they do. I mean, we know that they, at, at the very least, care for their young very, very much while they are still juveniles because they will well, you'll think that they'll want to rip your head off if you're in their area, like you mentioned in Hawking Hills. Yeah. So it really, it just, it just depends on how quote unquote human they are in their behaviors. And I have the big long joke right now running on our show saying Bigfoot's a manatee because it may be a manatee. 
but I'm not even sure Bigfoot's a primate anymore. But I do think they're highly intelligent. But those are human, you know, we're, I always try not to put human characteristics on them still because they look very human, so it's easy to do. Right. And they, you know, whether, I don't know if they're burying their dead or not, but they, they could be. They're smart enough to, I think, that that is an option. Not that I think it would do them any favors to be proven. I don't know your thoughts on that, but I think they're doing fine just the way that they are. But do you think that it would take a whole body or a, a significant portion of a quite intact, you know, still fur or hair on it body for these to be proven? Do you know why Ohio, Michigan, Indiana won't admit that there are mountain lions back? Uh, probably money for the national parks. It would destroy some parts of camping industry and some part of lumber harvest. If Bigfoot was proven to be real, it would cause pretty much a national like, international stopping of lumber harvest until we could ID population densities and all kinds of stuff, especially because they look so much like us. I do think there's bin bodies found I do think, uh, and I think they've been snatched up very quickly because we did it on an episode. It's uh, camping alone is the third largest industry in the U.S. So how many people are going to go camping every every weekend now that there's a big wild man running around out there that's right. snatching camp? And then lumber is like the fifth largest industry in the U.S. So there would be this overhaul for this endangered species that is looks like us. You know, we, we have trouble saving endangered species because they're, they, some of them don't look pretty and they get no love. I mean, I work with endangered species for a living. You know, they don't get any love unless they're cute. But now you have one that looks like your grandpa in the mirror, you know. You're going to, it's going to stop everything. So I think it would, I don't, I think they're fine. The only thing that them coming forward and that would take, it would take somebody probably to have a live one, I'm going to say in a cage and like having to take it down to Times Square or something and, and with a bunch of cameras. If you start spreading it out there that you have one in a body, I think it will be removed from you. I, the only thing that I think would possibly come from that is that there would be habitat protections, you know, like a, you know, big thicket in Texas and all this stuff would probably be, you know, protected areas and they'd get more privileges. That'd be the only positive, I think. I think they're going to do fine whether we have them recognized as a species or not. But I think other species would benefit from them being a protected species. So you mentioned you feel like there has been bodies taken, harvested, collected, however you want to label that. And this may be taking it too far, but then you do agree with essentially the black helicopter scenario? I do think it happens. I don't know how regular it's happened. And it might not even be the government. You know, I'm not that. Jay's a conspiracy guy. But there is too much money to be lost in logging and camping for Bigfoot to be proven it, it's real. You know, to, you'd have to, like, literally drive one up to Times Square. So I do think whether it's black helicopters or people being paid off, whether they kind of get wind of somebody who has maybe a carcass, and, like, here you go. Here's $2 million. Don't ever talk about it again. You know, we're going to take this. I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't know if anybody's ever been killed for this or not, but I definitely know money's changed hands for it. All right. You mentioned cameras. Let's talk about that. Okay. This is one of my favorites. So we have like 24 million trail cameras or something stupid on the U.S. continent. Why are there no pictures of Bigfoot? Do you have any guesses? I just think that they... They can sense maybe the, the whatever mechanism. I'm not, I don't know really anything about trail cams, but either the, the IR, the light, the, the something maybe running inside. I don't even know if that's a thing with trail cams. Plus, if, if someone came into my house and, and stuck something somewhere, I would notice it immediately. You pretty much got them. So the first one we're going to talk about is the smell. While people spray trail cameras with decenter for uh, like herbivores, like deer, it doesn't work as well with carnivores. They still pick up the plastics, the metals, the glues, the straps. You know, whether you hide it or not, they stink. So if you're an animal like a predator that's more wary of your environment, and now all of a sudden there's this giant chunk of plastic and metal, whether it's hidden or not, you can smell it. Then you already nailed the second most big one. The batteries, whether it's a battery-powered one 
or it's a solar one, it still has a battery inside of it. Batteries make a high pitch whine. So it's been proven mount lines, for example, will hear the whine and completely avoid the area. We can't hear it, but it's a high pitch whine. So whether you have this hidden in a log or you have it hidden, you know, around the corner or whatever, there's a high pitch whine that they can hear. The third and biggest one for me personally is how trail cameras are triggered. Almost all trail cameras have an infrared laser trip. So you have to trip that, and then it takes pictures or video. So you have animals like big cats that can see some infrared. So you have a laser pointer on the front of this thing shooting this beam of light out that if you can see infrared, you can see it. There's just a lot going against it. If Bigfoot has one of those abilities, whether to smell it, hear it, or see it, you're never going to get one. You can walk right through the woods like it's nothing. You know, you can zigzag all the way past these things. So when we look at stuff, I'll give you a tiger example here in a second, but you look at stuff like mountain lions, almost all pictures of mountain lions you see are juveniles. You rarely see older cats being photographed because they're smarter. You know, they've been around the block a few times. They know stuff, specifically in areas where we're still hunting mountain lions. Uh, you don't see big old cats on camera. It just It's not a thing that happens because they can see and experience all the three things I just told you about. Now, a lady, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on her name. Uh, she's one of the, I think she's passed away now. She spent 22 years in the field in China researching big tigers in this, in this one valley. She's been there you know, for 22 years. She's only seen a tiger two times. She's only seen elephants three times. And there's tigers and elephants in her valley. She never got a picture of one until she switched to a pressure plate camera. So literally, she had to bury a pressure plate in the sand. And then when something would press down, it would take a picture. She got one picture of this one tiger one time, and then the tiger heard the camera go off, and she never got it again. So these animals at a feline level are intelligent enough to avoid these cameras. So let's make it a little smarter. Let's say Bigfoot can sense one of these things. You're never going to get a picture of one unless it's running from something or it's a kid that doesn't care. You know, these juvenile Sasquatch, I do think, are a little more wild, just like us, you know. A toddler is, you know, it's crazy. They don't know what they're doing. And then a teenager doesn't care. And then these big adult Bigfoot you don't ever see. I had never thought about the smell, the actual smell of the trail cam. That's the first time that anyone's ever brought that up. That makes so much sense. And then isn't it funny, though, Justin, that it, with as fancy and smart as we are, that we cannot come up with a trail cam that, now this doesn't negate the whole IR thing and this, the smell, of course, but that we can't, can't come up with a trail cam that's somehow completely silent? It's So the only one that would be kind of like it would be that pressure plate system. It's like an old-timey, like... uh chemical camera mm. so it doesn't make a sound until it triggers uh but the batteries in modern day trail cameras whine it just batteries make noise whether people realize it or not we can't hear it you know yeah but it's always it's like a hum so it's there's a lot against trail cameras and this is like the stuff and you've heard it and we've heard it where these people that are not just skeptics of bigfoot are complete bigfoot haters and these are the things they come out aggressively you know, why there's 24 million trail cameras in the U.S. Why don't we have pictures here? You don't really see pictures of adult mountain lions either, and we know they exist. We don't, you know, we have all these, you see herbivores on this thing, these things that their whole system is developed for other ways of detection. Carnivores, you don't see them on these trail cameras as, you know, as often. You know, bobcats are even pretty rare in areas where you have bobcats, and they're a lower-level carnivore. All right, so you already kind of brought this up a little bit, so let's swing back to this to kind of close it up. We've, we, you guys too, you've, you've had somebody on, it starts out as a quote unquote normal Bigfoot encounter, and then it takes a hard left, like hard. And you're like, oh, okay. And it doesn't get any less believable because the person hasn't changed tone. They might still be reliving that experience and they were terrified. And this is exactly what they're saying happened. So in, in your opinion, because obviously you're not one to discount this to where you're going. I'm not going to talk about this. What is your opinion on those encounters that have these strange aspects to them? So, like you said, we've had both examples on our shows and stuff like that. Sitting across from these people, most of my, you know, I believe them. Whether what whatever they experienced or not, it wasn't my experience, but you can you can tell, you know, and I'm a big believer that you can read people when especially when you're in the same room with them the woo side of bigfoot is just as real as the flesh and blood side of bigfoot to me 
I never experienced it. I can't explain it, but it is. Do I think they're the same thing? Personally, no. I think there are two things that are kind of being, at least two things, being kind of lumped under the Bigfoot umbrella, where you see this thing, whether it's the fey folk taking on the shape of a Bigfoot because you really want to see a Bigfoot, so that that's where they're glowing red eyes and them walking off cliffs, and that stuff comes from. Or it's aliens or whatever you want to call it, interdimensional or, you know, it doesn't, I don't, I, I don't have an answer for that, but I believe those people. I believe in what they've seen. At least they believe what they experienced. If that makes any sense to anybody. No, it does. Oh. And I've, I've definitely mentioned that on my show where I've, I'm kind of in the, for right now, at least I'm kind of in the mimic camp, as you mm-hmm. say, you know, the fae taking a shape or whatever right. it might be. I mean, people, People will go in the woods and, and hear their, their names called. And when we've heard recordings of Bigfoot trying to say a name or call dogs, they don't they don't quite get it right. Uh, and, and people have gone into the woods and heard a friend maybe call their name. Uh, I'm speaking specifically about a lady named Debbie that there's a certain area that she and her friend had gone into and they took different forks of this, you know, this path. And she thought that her friend was crawling around in the brush and calling her name. And it sounded exactly like her friend. You know, it wasn't like someone with a hearing problem trying to speak. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely the proponent that maybe it is like this mimic situation. And then in certain instances, people are going, well, it was definitely the Bigfoot that just poof and disappeared. Because I saw a Bigfoot and then it wasn't there. And right. And I know that we're trying to you know, I- explain one odd thing with another, but let's face it, those other odd things are seemingly out there according to the people that we, we talk to. Yeah, and I'm right. I'm I'm in the same camp with you. And my big thing with the Fae, or even when you start looking at North American legends with skinwalkers and puckwudgies and stuff like that, a lot of times they'll put on the mask that you want them to wear. And by that, I mean, if you're going out there with Bigfoot in your mind, and you run into a fae, they'll dress up like a Bigfoot for you because that's what they think. In, in my research, is, it's what it seems. It's what they think you want them to be. The problem is, is they're not fully physical beings. So they have the weirdness, the glowing red eyes, the skinny Bigfoots, though, where they walk off cliffs. Uh, we had, you know, heard around, around the Brown Mountain Lights where there was a group of Bigfoot walk right off a cliff as people were following them. And then, like cartoon style where they never dropped or nothing like that. You know, they just kept walking. And it's almost like, you know, the cartoon style, like them trying to lead you off the cliff, follow us. And when you look at stuff like puck wedgies, they have a lot of that trickster nature to them where they're screwing with you. The jokes, they may not be quote unquote evil, but the jokes, the punchline may be your death, that kind of deal. I think that's what's happening a lot. The paranormal world is real. It's just hard to study. The only real difference between paranormal and science right now is understanding. The stuff that we're working on, like this computer we're talking through currently, 50 years ago, this is magic. They couldn't have explained it. What will we understand in 100 years? What will we understand in 300 years? You know, it's the paranormal, I think, is just as real as anything else. It just is hard to understand. Yeah, I think uh, there's a line from The Fourth Kind that kind of explains the whole thing, the whole, it's not an owl, you know, and then it, okay. it's it's just like that trickster element, as you said. Okay, so very, very last question, and I think I, I you kind of have already mentioned this, but I just wanted to get maybe your final closing thoughts on this. What do you think Bigfoot is? Oh, it's a manatee. Definitely a manatee. <laughs> so by that, I mean, Bigfoot, to me right now, currently in my research, the flesh and blood side of Bigfoot is a part of a much more ancient order of animals. Uh, I don't think they're primates anymore. I've, 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 but my opinion changes on Bigfoot probably every couple of weeks. And, you know, we have somebody else on the show and you do a little more research and <laughs> yeah. I think something else. Uh, but right now, with the luciperconum, the, the eye shine that Bigfoot have, you know, this reflective layer, ancient primates have it, no modern day primates, at least very few to my knowledge. Uh, some of these other, like you hear the spider crawling Bigfoots and the, like the, this weird double jointness and stuff like that. And where they can, where I think they're dropping down on all fours instead of like disappearing. You know, some of these people say they disappeared and I think they may be actually dropping on all fours. So now this eight foot tall animal you're looking for is now three foot tall. So you don't really see it. So 
when I say manatee, manatees are a part of an order. Their cetaceans are not cetaceans right now. They are uh, sirenians. And their sirenian group actually a long time ago split off to became a whole bunch of different types of animals, whether it was carnivore, herbivore, freshwater, saltwater, land, whatever. So they're a part of an ancient order. They're the last kind of group of an ancient order of animals from everything from elephants to whales to a couple type of hyrexes. So I think Bigfoot may be something like that, where it stepped off a long time ago and due to covergent evolution, which is a phenomena where two separate species end up looking extremely alike uh, that are not related. So, you know, crabs, you know, that's the kind of the joke with crabs. Everything keeps evolving to crabs. Crabs have evolved, you know, 11 times and they're not related very closely, but they've, you know, this body plan keeps evolving. Or you look at stuff like sharks and dolphins, you know, physically they look very similar. They swim a little differently. They walk a little, you know, for us, you know, us and Bigfoot walk a little differently. Our proportions are a little different. But to me, that could explain a lot about them, that they are not an ancient hominid. You know, they're not our cousin. They're much, much older than that. And that could be why they're so good at hiding. They've survived maybe a couple of mass extinctions, not just this, you know, this Ice Age mass extinction. So that's why I say Bigfoot is a manatee. Do you want to see one again? And is Jay super jealous that you have, in fact, experienced a Bigfoot? I don't want to see one again. I'm good. I'm, I don't think, I don't want to see one again. It depends on the encounter. Like if I was in a car and it was in a field, yeah, that'd be fine. But if I was in the woods and I just turned around and one's there, it'd probably be the last time I go in the woods. And I like going in the woods too much for that. And I think, I don't think that it's the fear side of like the, that the, oh, I'm in danger side of it. I think it's more the primitive part of our brains screaming at us that, you know, that thing's a lot bigger than us. that thing can eat us. I think there's the lizard part of your brain just screaming at you the whole time after that. Yeah. And we are trying, we're super hard trying to get Jay an encounter of something. Uh, <laughs> He's been put in some very, just every situation, somebody be like, hey, we're going out to X, you know, with these Bigfoot, these Bigfoot researchers. And I'll be like, yeah, I'll sit back with the kids and stuff like that. Jay will go, you know, here's cover them in peanut butter and, and eight <laughs> pheromone and just see what happens. And You're like tying them to trees with pheromones all over them. Like, have fun, bro. <laughs> oh, yeah. But he's tried. We're trying. Uh, there's a property we keep going back to that I sit inside and Jay goes out and sits in the back. They just know he wants it too bad. Yeah. And then the bummer is considering what we've already covered, is he going to run into the mimic or is he going to run into the real thing? I hope he runs into the mimic. <laughs> he's always out there whistling. Everybody knows anything about puck wedgies or windigos or anything <laughs> like that. It's the, the absolute awful thing. Yeah. You're not supposed to do that. And he's out there just whistling these big long. That's how you always find him. We'll be out in the middle of Wayne national forest and he'll be just down there. Like, yeah, he's dead. Bye, Jay. <laughs> this is 101, dude. You can't do that. Well, Justin, yeah. thank, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your encounters and your insights. I mean, a lot of stuff that you've said on this podcast, I will be regurgitating to other people. So excellent insight into things. Well, this is a humongous honor to ha be on here because we've been listening to you guys for, to you forever. And two years ago, I ever thought I'd been on your show. It, no. So thank you so much for taking the time and having me on. I graciously appreciate it. Thank you. And please let everybody know where to find you. Got any socials that you want to give out? And of course, where to find the podcast. Once again, it's Cryptids of the Corn podcast. You can find us on all podcast catchers. Our website is cryptidsofthecorn.com. Our, our email is cryptidsofthecornpodcast at gmail.com. But yeah, you can find us on all podcast catchers. Facebook, we do a morning show every Tuesday at 9 a.m. Uh, Instagram, we do a lot of stuff on that. We have documentary series coming out on YouTube. Uh, Hyenas in North America is our next big one we're working on. I'm um, just trying to think of what else. Uh, Patreon, we always have Patreon if you want to reach out and support. We have a lot of fun there. We just had our Halloween party. But yeah, Cryptids of the Corn, come hang out. Well, thank you so much again, Justin. You're welcome back anytime. Maybe next time Jay can join and we can do a little roundtable situation. Hey, that sounds good. Especially once he gets the, he needs the adult diaper after the mimic situation in the woods with him whistling and all that. Yes, we can we can find a, a sponsor uh, of some sort that has to do with adult diapers. Depends. Yeah. Depends on if he comes back or not. Exactly. It really does. Because then we won't have the round table. <laughs> Just be you and I going. We told you so, Jay. Sorry, bud. Wherever you are. He's dead. He go. He whistled and I heard a rock and then I heard <laughs> just puck wedgies laughing. <laughs> 
Those damn fuck wedgies in their overalls, you know, they'll get you every time. Thanks, Justin. <laughs>